And joining us again, CEO of Policy Equity. Let me welcome back to the show, Dr. Phil Goff. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I was waiting for your applause. So, all right. <laughs> Before you got here, Larry and I were talking about um, Tim Norman from Welcome to Sweetie Pies and how he has been arrested for conspiracy to kill his nephew, Miss Robbie's grandson. This was uh, several years ago, and it took them, I think, six years or four years to mount this uh, thing. So he's now been arrested by the feds. I said that Tim Norman is a symptom of a lot of things that ail uh, black America. And I'm going to speak specifically about black America because I'm black and I need black America to win. So I said, you know, all the people outraged and they're praying for Miss Robbie um, need to see how Tim Norman shows up in their lives and how they treat one another, how they act towards one another. Now, I know your thing is equity and police and we are holding police accountable. But I'm going to ask you, Dr. Goff, because I know you can handle this question. What's our responsibility to one another? You know, I'm getting this question a whole heck of a lot more, especially now the cameras are off and we can have conversations inside of the tent, right, with each other um, of, all right, so I'm good with whatever we need to do to make public safety better. Um, uh, but for real, what are we going to do in these streets? Um, what are we going to do with each other? Look, people have been talking about black culture um, uh, like it's black people's fault since the beginning, right? Like we mm. chose, like, you know, I, I don't want to live in a big house. Let me live in squalor. That's, that's what, I, what I really like. I like huts, right? I don't want, you know, all this kind of newfangled stuff with the laundry that's all indoors. I don't want to, let me, let me go pee outside. Like that's black culture because we chose it. That's a lie, okay? Let me be really clear on that. That's a lie. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have responsibility in each of our individual lives to try and do better. But it does mean that we should be skeptical when folks are talking about black culture. Like culture does not stem from structure, Okay. So right. to part of the degree we we're looking at, at crime within black communities, right, let's not, let's not be silly about this. Let's not imagine that black people like criming, right? It is reasonable in many of these communities to say, if I go to school, I work hard, I, I keep my head down, I try all I can, I'm going to still end up locked up. I'm going to still end up without the capacity to provide for me and mine. So what else am I going to do? This, the, the culture of America is built off of the creativity of black people trying to make sense of impossible situations. But the impossible situations for most of us don't lead to the invention of jazz right, and a killer crossover. For most of us, it leads to getting caught doing things that other folks said we shouldn't have been doing. I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just trying to put it in context. Right? So absolutely, it is up to black men to figure out how to treat each other and black women better. It is up to our communities to figure out how to make better decisions. But we can't imagine that that's, that's all it is is a choice. Choices, freedom, always happens within constraints. And for black folks, our constraints are stronger and narrower than most. So let's acknowledge that as we're moving forward. In. Let, let me thank you, um, because context is everything. And I think that's a lot right. of us, you know, jump off with opinions not rooted in any kind of contextual history, no, no framework, just, just our feelings. And even this discussion around crime in our community. Listen, I get up every morning pretty early and I go out and I sweep, I sweep because somebody got out their car and left a McDonald's box right at their, you know, and kept it moving or drank some water and threw it on the grass. Somebody decided to go to Dunkin' Donuts and put a cup on on uh, on the structure that's right in front of my house, you know? And so I sweep because I don't like to live like that. When I ride my bike, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking. And then I'm very loud about how dirty and nasty you, you know, so I'm like, I'm that person too, which is dangerous, <laughs> right? Because we talked about that. People don't want to be checked, right? But I imagine that no one ever told you that this is improper to litter in your own neighborhood maybe no one ever told you that but it's improper so i i I struggle with this every day at the same time i i love us so we need to have this conversation and whose responsibility is it to to say don't walk across my grass because it's my grass and you're killing my grass don't do that that's not proper see see karen and and i I love the way that you frame this as well because i I feel like I want uh, for both us to understand this and for us to have a language to explain to other people, you know, especially when the the protests 
um, involve fire, right, when they involve blowing things up. I had all kinds of, you know, you know those well-meaning white people who you're the one person they know, so they'd be trying to, so I, I, because of my position, I have a lot of those folks. And they were going to like, oh, well, you know, Dr. Phil, um, you know, it's terrible what the police have been doing, but, but y'all really do have to stop burning down your own stuff, right? And it would, it would bother them in a different kind of way. And it, it occurred to me like four or five days in, I was like, oh, I see, I see the mistake. Here's part of what's going on. I said, so for you, you live in a community of folks who own their stuff and you work for yours, right? You might be second generation college, but you work for yours. And the idea that someone would burn down their own thing doesn't make sense. And in fact, it is insulting to the way in which you try and teach people to value. You are, you are operating under the delusion that this stuff belongs to black folk. They don't own nothing in that neighborhood. They're burning down your stuff. You just don't know it yet. And what I love about the way you framed it is for some of us, we got to take ownership of it even if we don't own it. It has to be ours because we're here now, even if they won't let us legally possess it. And that's a hard balance to strike, right, in terms of community. It's a hard balance to strike. But it's necessary for many of us, if we're going to make something more of the community, is to have ownership even when they won't let us own. But again, there's that structure. Because if they let us own, I guarantee you, activism would look differently, as would your morning commute and your morning sweep. <laughs> And so I think, Dr. Goff, it's always good to talk to you. So I'm really excited to have you a part of this conversation. Um, and I think that what you're, what you're outlining really is talking about violence as against property, right? Violence as against physical institutions and physical structures, whether that violence is blowing up a CVS or whether that violence is, I just finished half my, my, my soda water, so I'm going to toss the can on Miss Karen's lawn. Uh, and that is definitely one type of violence um, that I think we, we see people wrestling with a lot. Like, we know that this country has always preferred to protect physical property over black lives. And so that, I think, makes a lot of sense. Like, I, we don't own that CVS. And in fact, most of us were probably racially profiled in that CVS and did not feel respected when we were spending our hard-earned money in that CVS. And that's certainly one type of intracommunal violence. But the other type of intracommunal or, hor or horizontal violence is as against other black people as against other black people. And we had said earlier in the beginning, you know, I'm like, black on black crime exists only if white on white crime exists, if Asian on Asian crime exists, if Latino on if crime lit exists where you are at. So there's no such thing as black on black crime that is any structurally way different than any other types of crime created or, or, met or perpetrated in other communities. But the I think the the added burden comes in when we see acts of violence, like uh, Karen mentioned the two drive-by shooting victims, the young girls who were shot. Um, I mentioned the sister who, following the advice of black elected leadership, said, you know, we're not going to call the cops on these brothers when they're blowing up, you know, firecrackers all hours of the night. We're going to talk to them. And then she talks to them. Next thing you know, 15 minutes later, she's dead in the street. And, and thinking about, like, the random acts of physical violence that I had mentioned last week about, you know, some brothers who was riding down the wrong way on our street, shooting 36 shots out the car. And just all of the ways that we are perpetrating violence as against other black people in a very anti-black way. And thinking about when you said culture, for me, it also uh, really solidified the idea that when we are culture, when you are enculturating something, when you are cultivating something, you are helping it to grow, you are nurturing it. If I'm cultivating a garden, I am helping the agriculture of my environment. I'm helping to grow it, to nurture it. And while black culture doesn't exist in a vacuum and it's not our fault, um, we definitely have enculturated and we cultivate behaviors that are antisocial that are specifically reserved for black people and for me that is a result of slave culture and, and generations of anti-blackness that we have been forced to embrace and so I wonder how you would what would you say with, or where would you take your analysis if you're thinking not necessarily about violence as against property but violence as against other black people yeah, I mean, and again, you're, you're putting it in the right context. You're talking about, like, this thing didn't start yesterday. This was not a decision that I made today, right? We got to go way back to set up the, the right set of structures to understand what's going on. Now, look, um, you talked about these are, these are things specific to black folks, and I'll say that's the same way that we need to be talking about black on black crime. Where on earth is there poverty and deprivation, but we don't also see physical violence? Where, where has that's that right. ever happened, right? Um, and I'll go one level deeper. 
if you don't have physical property that belongs to you, if you don't have political power, the ability to determine how your voice is used, how your future will look, if you don't have those things, what you have is your name and reputation. Now, you hear all, rich people talk about that all the time. Be like, well, my reputation. But no, yeah, yeah, that, your reputation was the name brand you were born with and the silver spoon in your mouth, okay? But I'm talking about up here in Harlem, that same thing. I have folks doing spray, uh, you know, whatever the, the sparklers up at one in the morning. I was like, what are you celebrating at one? But regardless, um, um, <laughs> your reputation is your ability for, to, to let folks know they can't mess with you. They can't take what you've earned. And, in fact, that reputation is more valuable than anything you earned on a given day. So in those contexts, when the state is not there to protect you and your property, your reputation has to do that work. So sometimes this violence that feels like, well, it's like, why are you fighting somebody because they scuffed your Nike, right? It's because my reputation is literally more valuable to me monetarily than that Nike could ever be. Mm. That is a result not of the violence of street crime, but of the violence of poverty. And we need to start talking in those terms, mm. right? That's a structure well, mm, that we set that... up for that, right? <laughs> Laurie Daniel Favors, Afro State of Mind, is here, of course. Philip Atiba Goff, uh, Dr. Goff, he is a professor of psychology, African American studies at Yale University as well. Um, he's here. Uh, as you're talking, a couple of things. Uh, first, I was speaking with Doma T. Pongo yesterday, who um, we were talking about Africans and African Americans, because there's a, there's a whole debate about who's black. Maybe we'll get to that. But he said something that, that struck me, uh, and, I, and I could speak to it because I actually physically was there and I saw it. He said, poverty in America leads to violence in the black community. And as you're talking, I think about the, the reason why it's hyperly, I'm sensitive to it is because we could literally have a knee on our neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, be shot in the back, be 12 years old, and be shot in three seconds have a registered gun and be shot while a baby's in the back and be filmed dying. We could be choked to death uh, for not even selling Lucy cigarettes. And we can see that. And at the exact same time, I have to also navigate the violence in my community. So it's a, it's a, it's a battle that most communities don't, you know, you could talk about white on white crime and Asian on Asian crime. But in addition to that, they don't also have to deal with police violence, right? So we have, Police violence, institutional violence, being followed in stores, all the assaults on our being. And then I got to come home and deal with you. And I don't want to call the cops on you because and then I but you could shoot me if I directly uh, confront you. So there's that. But Domati said yesterday in Africa, in, in, in Ghana, where he's from, uh, his parents are from. Poverty doesn't equal violence. And I saw people with m missing limbs, uh, Phil, uh, Dr. Phil and, and Lurie. I saw people who were little and hungry, no shoes. You know they were poor, and they were not violent. And it wasn't just that one, because I went back of town. Like, I, I don't travel the way most people. I'm going to get a car, we're going to go drive. I'm not doing a tour. I didn't stay in a tourist hotel. I stayed in the town. And I didn't see that, right? And I, I, And he said something about... The culture, you can be poor and still have a sense of value. So I want to I throw that back at you. But I, I would say, though, they don't live with their Hitler, right? They live with other forms of oppression. We live with our Hitler. And so, you know, and, and I'm not even being hyperbolic. Like, like we live, like, it's as if, uh, and I've said this before, Nazi Germany was inspired by American racism. The perfection of racism, not just as a culture, but as a, a structural model around which one could politicize oneself, around which one could base your entire political and, and economic foundations, we still live with our Hitler and are able to be manipulated and toyed with and denigrated in ways that they can. Now, that is not to say that the governing structures throughout the continent of Africa or even in the town that you were at are not also in some ways oppressive. It's not to say that they're not also in some way, you know, I, I would not want to paint that as a, as a No, as I wasn't doing that, right. No, 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 no. I not. understood, right. understood. I just want to make sure, you know, because you know the false equivalency is going to come out. But, uh, or in the comments, but I just want to be clear, when we live in a space where we are despised, 
where we are despised from without and have been taught to despise from within. Dr. Joy DeGruy talks about this. And when Dr. Goff, when you mentioned respect and my reputation, she did a study of over 200 black boys. And one of the things that she found was that respect and the lack thereof was life altering such that if I do, if you have disrespected me, I must take your life because that is what I have been taught by the society I'm in. When you live with your Hitler and you don't have a culture we were not, you know, while uh, the continent of Africa was colonized and while much of their culture was Europeanized, we were literally forced from our languages, from our a way of identifying with each other and with the divine. And that result and being the sons of Ham, the cursed descendants of Ham, and being taught even through our religious perspective that we are devilish and diabolic, that has an impact. And we are not addressing that in our after school programs. We're not addressing that in our, our medical training programs. We're not addressing that in our black scholarship. We ain't even addressing that in our HBCUs. And that, I think, is a fundamental difference that really does shift how all the rest of it plays out. I mean, she ain't standing up a lot on any of that. Um, I'll, just, I'll add to it. When was the last time that our political class in the United States articulated a message that said, poor black folks, we all win when you do? We're in this together with you. And it wasn't just a line to get votes, right? Usually not even from those poor black folks. So when you talk about how poverty looks different across the, the globe, that's in part because of the way that colonialism works, part to, partly because of the way that integration has worked. Because um, you've you got to be integrated before you can segregate. you got to be living next to somebody before you can tell them they can't sit at the lunch table, right? So it's partly all those things, but it's also a sense of shared mission, and I think that's part of what we're seeing in this moment, which is it's scary for a lot of folks. And, I, you know, I don't love for people to be scared inside, outside of a Jordan Peele flick, but I, I'm okay with this kind of fear. Um, what's scary for folks is black folks saying the American creed has not spoken to me. It has not included me. So the dream that you have, it ain't my dream. That's part of the difference between what you see in the United States and other countries that are majority black across, I mean, not the United States, but countries that are majority black throughout the rest of the world, is that that hit on colonialism, that was real. And so at the very least, there is a shared understanding that even though I'm struggling, I know the people in the higher structures, they're supposed to have my back. Reality and corruption aside, that makes a real difference on whether or not I can, I can take this poverty while I'm going to fight it quite literally. 